often we like to minimize the importance of emptying out, relinquishing, giving up, abandoning, leaving behind. The allowing to dissipate of those aspects of ourselves that are not conducive to our welfare, to our benefit, to our well-being and happiness. To not give those things up while we are pursuing something good, while we are pursuing something truly marvelous, something that we keep hearing about as being very useful, a teaching, a key, a formula for success, anything. And especially when it comes to the Dhamma, the teachings of Lord Buddha. Whether it's the Noble Eightfold Path, whether it's even a meditation technique that we've received or we are practicing. All these require us to go all the way. See, when you're cooking something, you don't stop halfway. If you do, you will eat a half-cooked meal, which can even be devastating. You might get terribly sick if you're eating uncooked rice, for example. Some might even die, perhaps. So you have to go all the way. When you're building a chair for yourself or someone you love, a piece of furniture, or you get those, I remember um, in LA or other places I've lived where you would get, uh, let's say, IKEA furniture. And anyone who's ever heard of IKEA or work with, with any of their material, you know there's a lot of pieces usually that you have to put up, put them together, right? You have to, you know, use a screwdriver, you have to use different tools to put it together. Well, what if you do not tighten those bolts, tighten those screws? And then you get your loved one or a friend or yourself to sit on that chair. Well, guess what? You didn't go all the way. You did not finish the job. You did not complete the task. That is not how it was designed. With that in mind, to have it be, you know, all four legs of the chair come off. You have to complete the task. Now, what people often do, as I was saying earlier, is they carry with them the formula, either in thought, either in memory form, and they keep telling themselves stories. completely while neglecting the reality of who they are. This is what we're dealing with today. People want the best, but without going all the way. They do go, in a sense, sacrificing a lot for something else, however. They do go, if you want to you know, if you want to look at it that way, they do go all the way with something else. 
and their promotion of their self-image. There was a term as a layman I had heard once, and um, it's called peacocking. You know the animal, peacock? Especially the male version of the peacock. Um, in my travels, I've seen quite a number of them. I've seen one, uh, once I've seen them uh, in white. But usually they come in these beautiful colors, turquoise, this and that. And they are pretty, uh, you know, colorful. They are pretty. They are eye-catching. They are very attractive. And that's what we have often. We look at those traits of ourselves and we admire them so much that we start peacocking around those feathers of ours. So anything that we can use to kind of emphasize that, including embellishments that we carry over from the Dhamma, to enhance those feathers, to show off those feathers, we will do without hesitation. For those things, we will go all the way. This is something that Lord Buddha knew about, and that's why he termed it as Sakkaya Ditti. The formulation of this non-existent body called the substantial self of me, Sakkaya. Creating this truth in itselfness of this thing called me, which I will peacock around. And so we just can turn it into a verb, right? Peacock. So it doesn't have to be a noun. For these people, it's a very much of a, a live verb that has nothing to do with the Dhamma, however. Because the peacock aspect of themselves, what they show to the world, what they want to carry themselves as, manifest themselves as, present themselves as, has nothing to do with the suchness of who they are, the reality of who they are, the reality of who they are. The other day, the question you were asking about nobility, here you can actually think of it as um, nobility having to do everything with the reality of who we are and nothing with the stories that we tell ourselves. But that's what we are doing. We perpetuate an idea, we perpetuate this pseudo thing, this pseudo persona of a person who is actually not there really does not exist. An idea of the person being a practitioner, a dedicated practitioner, is not there. Now, being with a teacher exposes this. Being around true Kalyanamittas exposes this. And they fall out. Why? Because it's intolerable. And in a way, it's, it's I mean, who, you know, you, it's very understandable because this was the way the person has kept themselves safe, quote unquote, protected within their normal environment, end quote, normal environment. Now, for whatever, for whatever reason, excuse me, that people might be you know, gravitating or have gravitated to the Dhamma for one reason or another, which also one would deduce that it has everything to do with that aspect of showing off or peacocking some attribute or some idea that we had of ourselves, of how we think, sooner or later falls apart. Sooner or later it becomes exposed. Why? because of the truth of the Dhamma. Another synonym or definition for the Dhamma that Lord Buddha used quite often is that of truth. 
capital T, Satya. Truth and lies cannot coexist. Relinquishing of the conceit am, me, myself, these are my views, these are my way of doing things, and relinquishing those, basically, to want to drop those, and wanting to flaunt around like a peacock, they do not go hand in hand. Those two don't go together. But the problem is with this generation of practitioners, if you, call, if you can call them that, let's just say those who want to somehow rub against the Dhamma, get some of it on them, get something from the Dhamma. It really is not going to go far if it's not going to make those feathers of theirs shine more brilliantly. They will see that the Dhamma is not there to make them become more embellished, more pretty in their effervescent colors. No, the Dhamma is there to strip you of those feathers, to tear down your conceited position that you are okay, that you are fine, that you are beautiful, that you are smart, that you are unique. No. That's why those people who, you know, have this idea that there was a term growing up I would hear about, like I had classmates, you know, mommy's boy. You have plenty of those. Whether they're the only, you know, child of, of parents or one of many in a family. That attitude, many people carry that with them. They've never grown up as adults to take on responsibilities, to be committed. Other than this narcissistic view that I am okay. So... When you take such a person, when you take such a mindset, such an approach, even in yourself, because we all have to start from somewhere. We've all gone through some stage of narcissism, to my understanding. This is my observation. But sooner or later, we have to grow out of such states. A child grows out of that narcissistic view and starts seeing the world around them, not as a means for them to shine more. There's a problem when you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, and you, or 60s, or even older, and you still think that the world is there to make you shine more, to make you stand out more. It's the opposite, this path of Lord Buddha. And no, you don't have to be a monk at all. You can be a lay person and still benefit from the guidelines that Lord Buddha instituted. For example, in the case of monks, we don't quaff our hair. The outfits that we wear are made up of three sets of robes. There is no hairstyle that we have. The hair goes. In some traditions, the eyebrows go as well, which is wonderful because I've seen monks go ahead and start meddling with their eyebrows to make them stand out a little bit. Yeah, they don't have mustaches, but they have eyebrows, so they can twirl those ends of those eyebrows. I've seen this. These are all stupid. I've had people around you know, different parts of the world, wherever I found myself, in, uh, where, where people were not necessarily Buddhist, predominantly other religions, or etc., asking me questions like, but why did you shave your hair? 
I said, it's, it makes things so much easier. I don't have to worry about things like, am I putting on enough gel or the gel, is, there, is it going to hold? Or, oh, there's a patch of hair that's missing in this area. Oh, um, it's gray, it's graying here. All oh, that's nonsense. Plus, aside from all these and other benefits, there's also the benefit of not standing out as a me, as, oh, look at me, my hair, my outfit, my outfit, my look. Peacocking much. So there's no way that the Dhamma could be even in the vicinity of such a heart. It's impossible. You can go ahead and, I don't know, uh, enlist yourself or your services in the services of so many bhikkhus or this or that teacher or whatever. Or you can go rogue and become a, like, you know, uh, a free agent. And think you're gonna find a way and you're you're gonna make it. You're gonna you have all the tools. Thank you very much. You guys keep over there. I'm gonna do my thing. Okay, that's fine. I guess for you, because that's your life ultimately. But you're definitely not even in the same zip code as the Dhamma to begin with. Because this path of yours has led you for, throughout Sansara. Sooner or later, you're going to be in the slaughterhouse again. Sooner or later, you're going to find out it's too late again. Sadly, you won't remember, though, once you're in it. You're in a transformed body, in a different birth. You won't even remember any of this. That's the sad part as you're being chopped into pieces. As you're struggling, asking yourself those questions that some you know, people in the, in the past in, uh, in songs have said, in poetry, right? Why are we here? Where are we coming from? Where are we going? All that, you know. Charles Aznavour had a song like that. And you will never know because these are stupid questions to begin with, because the answers are there, and that's a wrong question to ask. Because you're not looking at the reality of you. You're still looking outside of you. Why are we here indicates that you already know that there is a here, me, there's this thing, there's this person. You accept this person as a wholeness, as a completeness, who doesn't need work. You see the conceit I was mentioning? This is the big one. Conceit is a terrible, terrible disease. It's the biggest elephant in the room wearing an invisibility cloak, and no one will see it, especially the conceited. Good luck. They will look and point the finger at others. Others who are like pointing and saying, but look at the elephant. They're like, what's wrong? There's no elephant. It's your problem, your problem, you're the problem, I'm fine, I'm fine here. Well, yeah, there you go. It's like a drunk person saying, I'm not drunk, I'm not drunk. What are you, you're drunk, you're, something's wrong with you, I'm not, I'm not drunk. You know, as they're, you know, hiccuping and all that. It's sad, it's depressing, <laughs> but it's true. While the person goes ahead, peacocking their way all the way to the slaughterhouse. Again. It's not easy walking the path of Lord Buddha. Why? Because it requires you to be honest with yourself. You need to make choices. This path is about making choices all the time, not just once. Not just once. You have to make a choice to walk away from fear, for example. You have to make a choice to walk away from stupidity. 
You have to make a choice to walk away from wrong friends. That takes guts. You have to have the audacity to make a choice to walk away from family and friends who are living without Dhamma. If there is no sila, there can never be Dhamma. And where there is no Dhamma, there can never be freedom. There can never be happiness, true, true happiness. So what is your uh, objective? The objective, if it's not followed through, if it's not applied, with two things. Yoni Somanasikara, which is wise, radical reflection, the attention to the right core of it, placed at the radical, the root of it. And two is applying right effort. These two things, if they're missing, then the whole thing is a sham. The whole thing is just a joke. The whole thing is just a ruse. You're faking it through and through. And there's a lot of fakes. A lot of fakes. See if you can actually, this is another way to test, either for oneself or for of others. If you can break the person from their paraphernalia of, you know, the peacock feathers, they're on. If you can break them from that, if you can challenge them, if you can dare them to empty those feathers, to shave off those feathers of theirs, to peel them off, to pluck those feathers from themselves. By the way, no one can do that for you, to you. You can, you're the only one who can. If you can challenge a person to do that, and if, you, if they're able to do that for some time at least, and gain happiness because of that, then they're on the right path. Now the problem is they will not even approach such a prospect, most people. And this is why suffering, understanding of suffering, understanding and appreciating suffering, not for the sake of glorifying some aspects of yourself, which is again, we're back to peacock land. If you're trying to be like a, showing off some attribute, oh, I'm a holier than thou, I'm a holy, I'm a holy, I'm a nice person, I'm a spiritual person, going through the routines, pretending, basically. Because that's not your reality. That's not your reality. You know that. And if you spend some time with people living with them, especially a teacher, they will know that. They will know that. Or if you live with the Dhamma, the Dhamma will reveal that about you every second. So what do you do? People drop the Dhamma and start telling themselves stories and completely neglect the reality of who they are. And they fall back to their old ways. Just like they've done countless, countless times before. Except that now they think because there's been some Dhamma here in their life, because of the generosity of teachers, because of the generosity of Lord Buddha, and some good deeds that here they've done here and there in past lives. All of that goes to waste. One more time, but especially the fact that they are born as a human. Lord Buddha says in the suttas, to the bhikkhus. It's so rare to be born as a human, but even more rare is to be reborn in the deva realm. People don't realize this. People don't talk about this. They make it sound like it's so easy to become reborn in the heavenly realm or to be reborn as a human, simply because you are now in a human body, enjoying the fruits of yesterday, the stale food, food and fruits of yesterday, by the way. 
does not, does not mean that you're going to be going ahead and really maintaining that in your next life. So conceit, or what I like to call peacocking your way, trying to bedazzle your way to Nibbana. There's no such thing. But that's the facetious, that's the show-offy culture we're living in. So you have people who read a little bit of Dhamma here and there, and they become experts, in their mind at least. And they share, they, they go on this and that, and then groups, and then they really tell each other things, and you know, it's the companionship. And it just it gets muffled, the dumbness. It gets... It, it distributes itself, and now you can't tell what's what. But when you have a person living alone, appreciating the value of seclusion, when they encounter some, someone else, it shows who they are. The quasi-dhamma, the pseudo-dhamma, the fake dhamma will show up very quickly. So, 